Okay. So okay. Welcome so welcome to everybody to this uh, second Oasis lunchtime talk of this uh, autumn period, and it's going to be also the last talk of the autumn period. Uh, next, uh, during the upcoming spring uh, season, we are scheduling to have five to six talks. So, so we're sort of uh, ramping up, uh, warming up uh, after after the 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 COVID situation to have more talks again. Today's talk is uh, by Emil Lundedal Lundedal Hammar, uh, uh, who who is our own guy uh, from Tampere University uh, uh, Center of Excellence of, of Game Culture Studies, but. Uh, working from Copenhagen and, and visiting here uh, us today. Uh, and, and the title of the talk is uh, International Solidarity Between Game Workers in the Global North and Global South. Yeah. Thank, you, so, thank you, Heike. Take it away. And thanks thank everyone you, for joining. Uh, yeah, like uh, Heike said, I'm Emil and uh, work from Copenhagen, usually here at the, the COE though, uh, where I've done some research on work conditions in Finland and Denmark in the games industry there. Um, however, what I will be present today is a bit related to that, but not necessarily not really what I work with primarily. primarily. So this is just kind of like kind more of a side project that I'm introducing to everyone. Um, um, this has, this been, has been or has or materialized into a, a, a research article that's going to be published in Game Environments, environments the journal. Uh, yeah, I think yeah. this, this December, December or early, early next, next year, year as part of a special issue edited by Patrick Prax. So, so in case you don't want to listen to all of what I'm saying, you can also find it in an article and maybe even cite it if you want to as well. Um, but anyway, the two components I have for this talk and what you can kind of expect is I'll, on one hand I'll do a bit of theory talking about like a theoretical engagement with the topic that I'll be presenting, but it'll, there'll also be some empirical findings that might also cultivate some type of thinking or some type of interest, perhaps in the topic that I'll I'll, uh, I'll be talking about, right? So, so just to, so you're prepared in terms of the, the different uh, categories, right? And yeah, basically, I guess the the interest or the the uh, the point of departure that I have is uh, is in the labor conditions in the game industry. That as something that has been covered extensively and in research and also in publications um, and media and so on, right? So you, we've heard a lot about the Western games industry, about uh, uh, how hard it is to work and how tough it is to work there, right? You Famously, we've had these, these examples of the EA Spouse in 2004 and the Rockstar Wives in 2011. Those are the most common cited examples. Uh, but basically, you have many instances or many occurrences of game developers, game workers talking about how hard or how tough it is to work in the games industry, right? You have examples of crunch, exploitation, and of course also discrimination and harassment, as we've also seen with these uh, Me Too revelations that have also come out in the past couple of years. So this is something that has been happening a lot, right? And of course, what has uh, occurred since then, or I guess in the, in, the, in the wake of a lot of this discussion in the last 10 years, is a lot of efforts at organizing and also establishing unions, especially in the North American context in the U.S. and Canada, right? So, you know, you've probably heard about Game Workers Unite, um, uh, which is not necessarily a union, but more like a, an organization aiming at promoting, uh, uh, forming union in the game industry. And this has also resulted in, not necessarily Game Workers Unite have resulted in this, but the, the more broader efforts have uh, resulted in, you have the Trade Federation Code, GWA, which has been established, but you also have actual uh, unions for game workers, such as I IWGB Game Workers or STGJV uh, uh, in France and so on. And of, of course, in the media, you also hear more recently about uh, uh, <coughs> Raven Studios, the QA team unionizing under Activision Blizzard. You also have examples of contractors working in Bioware, uh, in Bioware Edmonton, who also unionized or just starting to form unions, right? So you see these efforts at trying to combat the issue of the horrible or the tough working condition in the uh, Western games industry, right? Of course, you also have more broadly in terms of the discourse, you also even have this journalist from Bloomberg called Jason Schreier who write these different books that also like uh, mainstream publications about how tough it is uh, to work in the games industry, just as an example of what it's doing, right? And so what, I <clears throat> what my kind of aim here in, in just trying to not problematize, but just approaching the topic of work conditions and 
unionization and organizing from a different perspective is that much of this, in my opinion, is of course, and there's nothing wrong with this, this makes perfect sense, it's focused on a lot of domestic issues or challenges, right? So it's focused on what are the, what's going on in the US or what's going on in Finland or in Germany or in France and all these other countries, like specifically, and you also see this in research, where Brendan Keir, Ben Abraham recently also published an article on organizing in, in Australia, what that means. Uh, Rufino and, uh, Paul Rufino and Jamie Woodcock have talked a lot about the UK, uh, and Westar has talked more about uh, the ITDA more globally. And then uh, uh, Oli uh, Sotoma has also talked a little bit about uh, game workers in Finland. But so what I want to come with is, is more the, the, the global perspective, right? I want to come more from the top down. And to do this, uh, I'm going to introduce or talk about some theory, right? So, so are there any things we can learn from uh, labor history or theory, right? And so the two concepts that are kind of our theories that I want to like apply or talk or introduce to you today is, is uh, the theory of imperialism and the th uh, theory of, and I hope I pronounced this correctly, it's the Danish pronunciation that's messing me up, but labor aristocracy. aristocracy. I can't say, yeah. Aristocracy, I say in Danish, but... It's difficult for me to pronounce, sorry. And this is inspired by <clears throat> this book that I find really excellent by Zach Cope. It's not about the games industry, it's called Divided World, Divided Class. Basically looking at these two concepts and what it means for, uh, uh, yeah, I'll get into this later, but, but basically mean for, uh, for understanding uh, global relations between workers in different countries, which is basically what I'm looking at today in my talk, right? And just to establish or uh, qualify what I'm talking about, right? We can see there's something going on in the world. There is a division going on, right? That if we look at the world wealth map, you do see that North America, Australia, Europe uh, is uh, wealthier compared to other parts of the world, right? You see this well with life expectancy, although maybe the US is not doing too well here, but there's still some type of a uh, discrepancy. Um, of course, also in terms of uh, uh, preparedness for combating climate change and all the stuff that we're facing in the future. You also see that, well, I'm, I guess Finland or the Nordics is not doing so well compared to other countries, but still in, compared to South America and Africa, I guess it's a bit better. And then we also saw, of course, I think a good example more recently with the COVID vac vaccination distribution. You also, see, you also saw this uh, uh, discrepancy between the different uh, uh, continents and the different uh, parts of the world, right, where some get prioritized over others. And also, I'm not sure if anyone played golf here, but you can also see golf courses per million people. It's also like a, di a division of the world or maybe an, a symptom of something, right? Not, I'm not sure if anyone plays golf here. I'm not saying anything bad about it. Just saying that's a, that's a thing, right? So anyway, there is this common thing we often hear about, the global north versus the global south. But what I want to introduce today or talk about, about is imperialism in, in, in the political e economic sense. And this is not necessarily where we talk about imperialism. You think about these big empires, I guess Britain or Germany or France and uh, so on, who came in and conquered different parts of the world, but, uh, but rather we should think about it in an economic sense and maybe even also in a cultural sense, right? And this is where political economy helps us. And this book by John Smith called Imperialism in the 21st Century is, is, is a good illustration or uh, account of how this uh, theory operates or, or, or work, right? And instead of the usual terms we use, uh, global north, Global South, the economic, uh, a political economic approach is the distinguish between the core and the periphery, right? So the core is the U.S., Canada, Europe, Japan, Australia. The so-called Global North is what people call it. Sami Amin calls it also the Triad, since Japan is included. And then you have the peripheries, co colonies, or whatever you want to call it: Asia, Africa, South America, the so-called Global South, right? And John Smith basically says that in terms of how this imperialism functions in an economic sense is that. Uh, the impoverishment of the peripheral capitalist countries of the third world and the enrichment of the core capitalist countries of the first world are dialectically related process, processes that, that is, the latter uh, become richer insofar as the former become poorer, right? So there is this parasitic relationship between the, the, the imperial core, or the core countries or economies and the peripheral economies in terms of labor and the exploitation that I'll show here in a second, right? And so basically John Smith, he had, had an excellent article in opendemocracy.net called Imperialism in a Coffee Cup, where he looks at, so w when, when you go buy in the UK, a uh, two and a half pound cup of coffee, uh, not the measure weight, but the price, two and a half pound cup of uh, coffee, what are this, the, the costs associated with it, right? And, and here he basically shows that the, the coffee farmer's share is 0.1%. 
very minuscule compared to the rest of what's going on, right? A lot of other things get interwoven into what is the, the GDP or the gross domestic product of the UK, uh, in a sense, right? That, that the value that the farm, coffee farmer creates is then uh, uh, expropriated by uh, the market in which it's being sold, right? For this particular price. The Tricontinental Institute, if we want to look at it more like in terms of technology and what we also hear, it's about games, also did the same in terms of their article in 2019 called the rate of exploitation in iPhone 10, where you also see where the, the profits from the, the construction of an iPhone 10 go to, like which countries did it achieve or uh, did they receive these different things, uh, and what about the labor and the materials involved in it. And you just, as you can see, Apple receives 58.5% of a thousand dollar iPhone when it was uh, 10 when it was sold in back in 2019, right? So just to show that there is something going on in terms of when something gets produced and where the value or the surplus value that's being generated, where that ends up. Um, so basically, when we talk, you know, we talk about colonialism, we talk about imperialism. This is a thing of the past. Uh, it's just a minor side note. You know, you have like these state leaders coming out and apologizing for colonialism or slavery and all these things that happened and saying this is, it's over now, uh, and so on, right? But what this political economic uh, approach to it shows, at least, or reveals the economic relations that are still uh, colonialist in a sense, right? So what John Smith writes is that capitalism has involved new and far more effective ways to plunder than by sending armies to ransack poor countries and butcher their people, to some extent, right? So a lot of stuff about theory, a lot of stuff about uh, more uh, political economy, but of course, I think the games industry I think it's non-controversial to say is uh, functions as part of this uh, economic relationship or global economic uh, relationship in the sense that, you know, the top grossing companies are those who earn the most money and most profits and revenue are primarily or have always been uh, US based companies until more recently Tencent from China has entered the top 10. But otherwise it, that that's, has mostly been the, the, um, the, the common thing. Although of course Japanese publishers have also been part of this, but you could argue they are, they are also part of the so-called imperial core. Of course, you see the big, big markets in terms of consumers, also in the uh, so-called core countries or the global north. And then non-controversial as well, you see this with hardware manufacturing and also the game production itself with outsourcing uh, to, to cheaper labor markets, you know, in Eastern Europe or South Amer America, South Asian and also East Asian uh, countries, right? Where it's simply cheaper to produce or develop certain aspects of a game production, right? So uh, 3D assets is, is the most common thing that gets outsourced. Um, and then of course you also have the problem of e-waste and, and all this stuff where primarily that gets sent off to uh, Nigeria is the co most common example. Once we're done uh, consuming our Playstations or iPhones or uh, Androids or whatever, right? So that you have these, um, you, you, you could call, at least I think it's not controversial to say that the game industry is part of this uh, economic system, right? And we have from 2001 is uh, uh, Stephen Klein and others, uh, Digital Play, I think was one of the, the, the first ones that at least published and talked about this. And then you of course have Effort Curse Global Games, which is also a really good book that illustrates or maps this relationship out or economic system out, right? So of course, all this stuff. So what does this mean? Like what, so I'm, <laughs> I'm gonna get to, to my point about game workers and international solidarity in a, in a second, but but does this have an effect on, on the societies we live in and our attitudes toward each other, that there is this stratification of labor between different countries, right? Does this affect how we view each other and, and, uh, and so on, right? And here, again, I'm gonna do another uh, concept or another theoretical thing, and this is invoking the term of uh, labor aristocracy. Aristocracy, uh, I almost got it there, but... Um, this is, 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 is also derived from like a Marxist theory, a Marxist history, where Frederick Engels was probably the first to coin it or talk about it because he wondered um, why in the 1880s, why haven't the, the English workers revolted and overthrown the ruling classes? Why do they keep putting up with the exploitation and the oppression in terms of the factories they work in and so on? Right? Um, and <coughs> Lenin would also try to use the same concept to, and I'll explain what it means, but would use the same concept to, to try to explain why, how come back before World War I did the, the socialist organizations ally with their uh, own ruling classes to, to fight each other and, uh, and, and uh, ally, ally themselves with their own 
bourgeoisie, right? And I think another kind of, I guess the scholar not mentioned less so, but still also interesting or fruitful for this conversation is W.E.B. Du Bois, who talks about <coughs> white indentured slaves in the, in the North American colonies. How come they allied themselves with uh, the white slave owners rather than allying themselves with the black uh, enslaved people uh, who were there, right? Uh, like, what, what, why does this uh, conflict of interest make sense? Like, how do we account for these uh, uh, discrepancies, right? And so, uh, the answer to this from, from these different scholars, uh, different people, um, is uh, basically bribing from the fruit, uh, bribing the working classes or parts of the working classes, uh, what they would call the labor aristocrats, for example, from the fruits of imperialism, uh, right? So, through the British plunder of India, for example, you would reward the parts of the English working class or the labor aristocrats with, um, with a, a extra money, better wages, uh, it, yeah, just, just material or economic bribes, basically, right? Uh, also, maybe even uh, <coughs> also uh, more, I guess, uh, psychological or cultural ideas about white supremacy and patriarchy in the, in the case of Du Bois, who also used the concept of public and psychological wage, that's at least his quote, right? That, that uh, white indentured slaves receive some form of privilege or some form of uh, wage, both psychologically, but also ma materially in terms of their position in the North American colonies, right? So there's this some, some kind of bribe going on in terms of why certain groups of workers ally themselves with the ruling classes against all other fellow workers, right? So Kurzweil has like a good article uh, on basically going through labor aristocracy in, uh, in, in, the, in the theoretical history. And he basically defines it as a pri privileged group of workers who are prone to conservatism because of said privilege and thus unlikely to support movements towards socialism, for example, right? Uh, Ingles also has a, had a good example. I talked about imperialism, you know, and the colonies using to bribe, but also Ingles used the example of women and children in, in the English factories who also received less wages than their male counterparts that also then served as a form of exploitation that, was, that goes not only, uh, that doesn't only derive from the colonies or imperialism, but also from domestic uh, stratification, right? Um, yeah, and so basically, so what, uh, I'll get into this at the end, of course, but I think what's interesting about this concept is that it, it gives us, a, a, I would say, a material basis or an economic basis for when we see discrimination and chauvinism, right? That there is a, a, a material investment into how society or how the economic relationship is set up because we receive some, form of, uh, not we, but some parts of the working class receive some some type of bribe from our position in society or in the global stratification of labor, right? So that, I'll get into this later because this is more, um, yeah, uh, more broad, a broad thing, broader thing, right? So the question is, of course, does labor aristocracy in the games industry exist? This is not something that has been fully answered. There's not been like a political economic account of the wage differences between, let's say, the, uh, the peripheral countries versus the imperial core. Um, but I think uh, Ergin Bulut's A Precarious Game is an interesting insight into it, or a, a dig at it at least, where he did some qualitative work in a North American game studio to see, um, he calls it the dream studio. And in it, he forks in one of the things he identifies is uh, um, that the workers there in, in this, uh, uh, I think it's an American or a Canadian company, they are allowed to make their dream game, right? And that, that's their dream. <laughs> or their, their ambition to, to it's really nice to develop video games or digital, <coughs> digital games, right? And, and then uh, Boulud basically argues or says that this dream game is only possible through the domestic labor at home by their wives who take care of the children or the house and so on, on one hand, but also the, 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 the global stratification of labor in terms of people who do, the, the workers in, in China or Malaysia or Indonesia and elsewhere who produce the hardware or the software support or the QA and all these other things that make game production of the dream game possible, right? Another interesting, this is not uh, like a, a book as such, but this is a, a thesis or a doctoral thesis or dissertation by Carolyn Young for Concordia in Canada, who wrote this uh, dissertation called Bringing, Politi Pol Bringing Politics into it, organizing at the intersection of video games and academia. Basically, looking uh, or inspired a lot by the stuff in, we saw with Gamergate and all these other uh, kind of reactionary movements in gaming communities and more broadly, and then 
kind of analyzing it in terms of what I've also talked about with imperialism and also fascism or theories on fascism. And then I've also published research, uh, also in game environments, fun, fun enough for a different special issue, about similar topic. Um, one thing that would be really interesting that hasn't been done yet, I'm just putting this up here, is, is the concept of imperial mode of living that was introduced last year and, and has been part of some uh, dis di discussions around whether or not people who are not only workers but also consumers are invested in you know, cheap goods, cheap consumer goods and maintaining this type of relationship. Uh, but that's a different discussion, just putting it out there. So if anyone wants to research or do something about this, you, I would be happy to, uh, to read it. Um, yeah. So basically, these things we have with you know, being bribed by imperialism or having certain interest in maintaining a, a, this, this type of domination, does this also affect organizing and, uni and unionization in the so-called uh, core countries? Right? Does this, when we hear about Game Workers Unite and we hear about all these other things, are there, in th are there challenges we should be aware of? Right? And this is basically the, the point of my talk. Uh, getting to it now, right? But um, so for this, and now we're done with the theoretical part, and we move on to more the, I guess, more empirical findings, you might say, right? So what I did in the brief time I had working uh, as a precarious uh, post postdoctoral academic uh, with a family and everything, I, I talked, uh, uh, I contacted organizers in game companies. Uh, I also talked to the union representatives and also executives of uh, federations, like uh, a trade a union federations, right? So trying to understand or, or, or contact them to hear if they wanted to do an interview or a survey that they could fill out online to entirely anonymous. Um, and <laughs> the response rate was not that well, uh, but that's also my problem because it, uh, it, was, uh, it was a bit short, I guess, in terms of time. But the total amount of people I talked to were five, you know. So this means on a methodological level and an epistemological level, what you're about to see is of course not representative of what th this topic actually covers, but it's about more about at least showing, let's say, showing um, what people who work with these issues think about the problem of labor aristocracy and imperialism in terms of international solidarity. Because they're perfectly aware of these challenges and these interest and how do they then work with this in their everyday lives, right? And what uh, in their everyday practices of trying to organize or agitate or trying to collaborate across different countries or different borders with different game companies, right? And so, <coughs> so yeah, so you can take it or leave it what I'm about to present because it's a low number, but it's still, I think it's, it's, it's interesting to talk about at least. This is also the point of talk. I think it's interesting to, to address these things and talk about these things. Um, yeah, and I basically collect, co collected uh, or gathered their, their input or their responses in different themes. One of the typical themes that came up is, of course, the international, international structure of the games industry. That's all what everyone uh, of the respondents mentioned. Um, you know, that it's a very international occupation to develop games and produce games. You work across different borders, not just only in Finland, if you develop games in Finland, but you also of course, collaborate and uh, maybe are owned by other companies uh, yeah, or outsourced perhaps, right? And one of the union representatives mentioned um, that, the, uh, <clears throat> that in order to like talk about what can Western game workers do with regards to, let's say, striking or collaborating with other game workers in, in the global south, that, that's what the term they used, uh, and then they said, like, so how could Western game workers uh, uh, identify themselves or locate themselves in the game production? How could they strike or use their <coughs> power or collective power to, 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 um, to resist or, or, or uh, collaborate with other uh, uh, unions? And then another point that was also mentioned was that some of the union representatives really appreciated the international conferences. Uh, so GDC, uh, the Game Developers Conference, for those who are not aware, was brought up as a good kind of flashpoint to disseminate and agitate, which is also where Game Workers Unite kind of originated, or at least got a lot of traction when they handed out flyers at GDC, because a lot of Western game companies uh, come to that particular conference. Um, however, in terms of the international structure, one of the other respondents said that it also, the international aspect also make it a bit difficult in terms of organizing or finding new union members because it means we are also more fragmented uh, in terms of like you work at home, maybe you're a contractor, 
uh, maybe you're outsourcing to other countries as such, and people are not really meeting in a physical space uh, or talking to each other. Maybe they're talking online, I guess, over Slack or Discord or something. But, but uh, he, he compared it to, I guess, uh, he, he, uh, he was a fund of Marx and so on, but, but compared it to the factory uh, in the 1800s where you had these social points where you could gather and talk over lunch or talk during work about your, your boss who was being an, an asshole or whatever. Uh, and you don't have that same social point he was arguing. Well, you can maybe this online thing changes things a little bit, or like online communication and social media, but, but that was one of his, his uh, things. Uh, another theme that emerged was um, national divisions and chauvinism uh, in terms of like the differences between different cultures and languages. One of the respondents, one of the, the, the agitators or the organizers in a game company mentioned the cultural and language differences when you do collaborate with other unions uh, across different uh, countries. Another thing that was mentioned was also in, let's say, in, uh, in North America when they had immigrant workers who come in and work on a game then they're reliant on these work visas, right? So you have these border regimes that make it very difficult to enter Canada or the US, and you're really reliant on your work visa, right? And this makes it difficult to also tell them or ask them, hey, do you want to join this union? Do you want to work for better hours? Do you want to strike? Because then the boss can say, well, we'll, we'll revoke your work visa, and then uh, you, you get deported or thrown out of the country, right? So that makes immigrant workers even more precarious. Um, and of course, you also have this thing that you've also probably heard before in other topics of things, right, where uh, you have the, 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 the let's say, the, the Western citizens, uh, or usually, this usually re referred to white workers especially, uh, who, who view these immigrant workers who come in and who take their jobs and work for lower salaries or put up with worse working conditions, and then they, they, they kind of compete against each other, right? The citizens in the US or in Canada or in Europe with these immigrants who come in and then take the jobs for lower pay. This is a common thing, right? That, that in, in other professions as well, you hear about this thing. So one of the respondents said that, for example, uh, the thing about national divisions and chauvinism is that employers will always have the option to undermine union organizing efforts by outsourcing or relocating their businesses to countries with fewer protections and lower wages. And employers will often encourage an attitude of competition between workers of different nationalities, including encouraging racist attitudes and seeing fellow workers as threats and enemies instead of the bosses, right? So it's not the boss that's the problem when someone comes in and work for lower pay. It's the, the immigrant worker, for example, right? That's the, the common theme. Another theme that also emerged was uh, the legal aspects of organizing and also the repression from country to country. So talking also to the, to the Union Federation executive that, I, that, uh, that was part of one of the interviews, um, really, they really stressed the, the, the so you have the different uh, legislation and, and national uh, legal frameworks for work, labor laws and for rights of workers and so on. Um, and that's of course really good on, on a domestic level and what we've been focused on, but it's a problem when in the games industry is, is structured internationally and you have to outsource, you have to collaborate across the borders and so on. And that's a problem or a challenge for union organizers. Um, and yeah, so and basically also the legal differences between countries. So what you, if you are a contractor who works in Canada and then you have to work for an American company, then the unionization is different because there are different rules going on in Canada versus the US, for example. And another one of the, 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 the union representatives also said um, the bosses, they are organized internationally. I think that, that was a good point that they, they collaborate and, and, and share and uh, disseminate capital across borders without any problems as such, but the workers are not organized internationally. Like that's a challenge, and which is also kind of the, the basis of the, my talk, right? And in terms of the repression that I mentioned earlier, you know, you have typical examples of so-called union busting where companies or bosses go in to try to like uh, uh, divide and uh, yeah, divide or, or disrupt uh, uh, workers from organizing and forming unions. But one of the, the, the Union Federation executive mentioned also like in other countries such as Colombia, India, if you even talk about unions or something else, you, uh, you might face threats or even violence uh, or prison if you, you even like try to have this conversation. So that's different, what do you call it, methods of trying to agitate and organize in these contexts. And then just a brief 
very, I mean, this, 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 this is a common thing for many people, not just in organizing, but that is hardly to find funding for, the, uh, let's say, for example, for the Union Federation or other, other organizers to simply just get money to, uh, to do this work, right, and hire people to help uh, uh, for, uh, agitate and unionize in these things. And then I, one of the questions was also focused on, so what strategies do you uh, would recommend or think about when it comes to establishing solidarity across borders or between different game workers in the core countries versus the peripheral countries or global north versus global south? Um, and one of, the, uh, one of the organizers in a game company said um, that one example could be also to connect, like in terms of combating what we've talked about with, with racism and chauvinism is also, to connect worker struggle to anti-war movements, right? So, so, so they mentioned the examples of, uh, in, in the North America, the U.S. Labor Against Racism and War Movement or organization, and also the Canadian Peace Congress, as examples of where worker unions go together with anti-war movements, for example, to also kind of, uh, uh, I don't know what you want to call it, create synergy between both movements and learn from each other about what is actually going on when you hear about let's say calls for war or calls for bombing or invading different countries or subjugating or san sanctioning them and so on. Um, another one of the, one of the organizers uh, also mentioned that you could train and educate specific organizers or specific workers in a union uh, through, let's say, theory, through literature, through research maybe, and then have these specific type of people within the union to form or combat certain types of racism or chauvinism if that would arise, or other forms of uh, uh, discrimination, if that would arise in, in, uh, in, within a union. Uh, yeah, I mean, this already exists in a way, but it would be nice to have more, have more resources for this. Uh, one, the, one of them was the Union Federation to work across borders with multiple unions, so you would, you would have like a, a, a global type of <laughs> union or uh, umbrella that would help uh, navigate and administrate working with different unions in, let's say, in India and Malaysia or Singapore with, let's say, North American game companies. Um, but I think one of the, the, the most interesting things that came out of the data or the, the few interviews I did is that a lot of the workers share same struggles uh, or challenges, um, whether it's in, in, uh, in uh, let's they mention Singapore, but also Malaysia uh, and India versus, let's say, the UK or uh, Europe. Uh, in terms of like, they are also in, in the global south, they're also worried about getting fired. They're also worried about losing their jobs. They're, it's the same type of worries that they also, that, that those in the core countries versus the peripheral countries have, right? That there are some similar uh, wor uh, challenges or worries, right? For individually at least. And also another thing that was interesting in, in terms of this equivalent uh, uh, challenge or struggle is, is sexual harassment and discrimination was also a thing that came up, you know, in terms of the Me Too, in terms of gender uh, discrimination at, within game companies that also actually served to link different organizers with each other because they had the same, uh, whoops, they had the same, uh, they had the same, uh, what do you call it, uh, yes, uh, uh, experience of harassment or workers who are being discriminated against based on their gender or their other types of identity. And, um, and that could be a form of linking across borders, right, to have the same type of, I guess, like Cloud Move would call it chains of equivalence. Um, but yeah, something akin to that. I think that was interesting, right? In terms of the importance of the game, of games, you know, when we talk about organizing, we talk about, you know, these, these different uh, issues. One of the, the, the organizers said, or had this quote, uh, uh, as game industry workers in the imperialist core, I believe we have responsibility to our fellow workers in the global south to resist the ways that our medium has been used to whitewash imperialist wars and dehumanize racialized people. However, in order to do that effectively, we need to build collective power, which is why I see labor organizing work as a critical component of anti-imperialist struggle. Right? So what the person here is getting to is, if you are dissatisfied with making, the, I don't know, the next call of duty where you have to blow up or kill some brown people or whatever it is that they're doing these days, um, isn't simply not just enough to talk about it or go tweet about it or like say this is bad and make articles about it, right? There also has to be some form of, I guess this is in general in terms of political action, there has to be some type of collective power that, that, um, 
that changes things or, or make the bosses or the decision makers rethink things, right? And, and for them, for this particular organizer, they thought building collective power or uh, labor, uh, <coughs> labor organizing as that type of work, right? Because there are definitely lots of game developers, game workers who actually don't want to make, uh, uh, let's say, Call of Duty. <laughs> Uh, well, some, but some are, but, but still, you know, the, that, that, that that would be a form of changing the games industry and, and, and maybe in the future as well. Um, yeah, I know that a different organizer also said, had this particular quote, uh, that the workers of the games industry might have a special role to play in the struggles of the future, as being the major entertainment media industry of our century, the game industry is also a major part of the propaganda machine and therefore involved in the reproduction of the imperialist world system at the level of ideology as well just in terms of qualifying why it is important to also talk about games in the sense uh, that we're talking about uh, with uh, organizing. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, lots of different themes, lots of uh, interesting things. Um, but basically, just to sum up the, the two parts of my lecture or my, my, my presentation here is, you know, the respondents, the few that I had, they talked about the international structure of the games industry and also the legal challenges. They talked about the shared struggles between <coughs> workers in the global north and the global south, at least from their perspective, uh, but also, of course, risk of chauvinism and racism within uh, the global north, right? Uh, and they mentioned some strategies such as education and parallel organizations or linking up with, let's say, anti-war, anti-sexist, anti-racist type of organizations or movements to that can kind of like, I don't know, create some type of synergy, uh, to use that word. And then more theoretically, I think also what I, I think my, my primary, <laughs> my primary, but I think my interest in this topic is also just because this has not really been covered in game studies literature as such, what I'm talking about, I mentioned Egin Bulut and, my, and Carolyn Young's work, of course, right? But, but what I find useful for these two concepts that I've talked about today is that through the theory of imperialism, you kind of look at the, uh, uh, the material relations between different countries or different workers. And then that in turn also, you know, uh, what can we say, that at least gives us an e economic account of why certain groups or certain strata are material invested in upholding the domestic and international stratification of labor or an oppression or discrimination and so on, right? So that's kind of the, um, I think one of the useful things, right? Because, and just to give like, a, I think I still have two minutes left, but or three minutes left, but um, I think my interest in this is also just trying to account or explain for what we're seeing in the world, right? When you hear about discrimination or sexual harassment or, uh, you know, uh, fascist winning in Italy or in Sweden and in Denmark and elsewhere, and people are like very prone to also saying like, oh, uh, equal pay between genders, what's next? Uh, you know, like there's a lot of people who are actually opposed to things that should seem pretty non-controversial, right? Or seem <laughs> innately good, right? Uh, and you know a lot of horrible things that people are like accepting or doing, right? And and I guess this is also like what I've introduced. It's also like an account for why is it that certain people are in uh, what think that let's say uh, refugees drowning in the Mediterranean is good, for example, or why is it good that we bomb uh, Iraq and Afghanistan or Libya and Syria and so on, right? All these different things, right? And this is one way, I think, as as well to to uh, to account for this, at least on a material or economic basis, based on the theories developed in political economy and also Marxism and uh, critical race theory. Um, and this, of course, is how I related to the potential challenges for organizing in the games industry uh, in terms of, um, what do you call it? Um, yeah, so right now we have the domestic focus and so on, and then perhaps the game companies or bosses will utilize or apply this type of uh, uh, chauvinism or uh, discrimination dis between different groups of workers, whether it's women or racialized pe workers or uh, immigrants or uh, workers in the in cheaper labor markets in Eastern Europe and South Asia and so on. Uh, but yeah, that's basically it. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Emil, for the for the great talk. Really interesting connections. Uh, you're drawing there, for example, the the one uh, uh, between the the 
the, the content of the games and unionization. Uh, I'm, I'm still sort of digesting uh, the stuff and, and trying to formulate a question in my head. Is there anybody right now? There is somebody with a question, so so we'll use the catch box and, and I'll throw it. And, and I try not to hit the projector. <laughs> Yeah, hello. Thank you for the talk. And my question was, um, if you faced any difficulties in empirical research, and is there any plans to extend on that uh, existing research with maybe more mm. interviews? Yeah, well, uh, yeah, thanks. I mean, uh, it depends on the job situation. <laughs> no, I think the thing is with, uh, with I mean, just like the games we, we have, uh, we see our product of uh, the work conditions, and I would say the same for academia as well, right? The, the stuff you're seeing is also a product of the work conditions. Uh, and this is more a side project, and COE Games Call is such a nice place to work at that they allow you this freedom and flexibility to do these things. And so, so this is... Um, so in order for this to have more empirical research, it will require more time, which will require... Um, a position or a job situation that would enable this because this is also I guess this is not necessarily that sexy for funding or finding other uh, uh, jobs as such uh, and also it's a bit controversial I guess or frowned upon in certain areas so if you write a certain funding application that mentions political economy I have received uh, comments or feedback that says this is too political <laughs> uh, so um, but um, but anyway you know the, the, the point is yeah I would love to do more research and I think I mean, you could basically ex uh, extend the number of interviews and the number of informants that, I, uh, that I've gathered. But I think initially last year when I started on thinking about this, um, I was also interested in, in interviewing or talking to game workers in the Global North or the Imperial Corps in perhaps the Nordics in Finland, Denmark, Sweden or Norway or Iceland. And then... The problem is then methodologically, how do you even t talk about these things without it being too explicit and too direct? And that's like a really, that's not something I've resolved, that, con that uh, puzzle, because how do you talk about sensitive issues and these things? And also, you don't want to talk about theory during the interview, like, like, what, like what I'm saying. So, so it's also about fo formulating an interview guide or a questionnaire. And that's why it was helpful talking to union organizers, representatives, executives from trade federations to because they are already familiar with a lot of these conversations. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, next question is from Olli. Uh, uh, thanks, Emil. Uh, a, a lot of sort of like thought-provoking <coughs> ideas uh, there. And uh, one of the things that uh, sort of like came to mind was I realized when I uh, listened to you that uh, Two and a half years ago, like in February 2020, I was uh, I was in Manchester. Uh, it was uh, an event uh, focused on ludo capitalism, and that was uh, well. Uh, there were, for example, some of the people you uh, mentioned in your presentation were talking about uh, ga uh, Game Workers Unite UK and uh, how they sort of like work with them and uh, and and all that. And I was just like in my mind, I, or I was sort of like posing a question to them uh, at some point that. That what what someone someone should study or like like a, what a great study would be like why is there no game workers unite mm. Finland uh, and I mean like we can probably come up with several different uh, answers I've sort of like for, forgot this but but now I, I I understand that you probably you're probably the person who <laughs> who has the best answers to this. And, and I mean, like, it's it's an interesting way because I mean, like, it's it's many of those those things you discussed that that uh, this is sort of like a particular idea of trade union in in Nordic countries, maybe particular in Finland, because uh, I mean, like, I mean, around like 75 percent of Finnish workers belong to a union, and it's it's sort of like an everyday thing. Uh, at the same time, it's also the, the labor law and some other regulations are sort of like uh, already. Uh, sort of like ensure you uh, a fairly safe position compared to many other mm. places uh, uh, in in the world, yeah. but but then then at the same time it's also about this uh, sort of like uh, 
sort of like uh, there's something something about something interesting about this sort of like labor aristocracy we're talking about this sort of luxury of like uh, of of like really focusing on these first world problems we we're talking about yesterday that ah oh why i need to develop only mobile games when i just like wanted to do something <laughs> else uh, uh, teeny tiny changes and my world would be perfect uh, so so i mean like like yeah, there's there's definitely something really interesting here, and uh, and and I I mean like I I don't know it it, it appears that I don't have a proper no. question. No no here. I think Sorry. no I, 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 uh, I, I, but but I mean like let's just like think maybe maybe we can go back to my original question. So why hmm. why is there no, no game workers fin, uh, game workers unite yeah. Finland? Well I mean uh, I, I think first of all I think you would also be more equipped to talk about the Finnish conditions of why there are because there are uni, uh, you know Finnish game union worker unions and. The, what is called Game Makers Finland, uh, and then I can't remember the other names of the ones that that the people I've talked to who also say they're part of unions as such. But I think the, I mean, some of the respondents have been from the Nordics, uh, and they do or are aware of this discussion between, let's say, the problems that they have in, let's say, in Denmark, for example, versus the ones they've talked to in India, uh, right? And and um, and I mean. They seem pretty jovial, or, or uh, the the people I talk to about this question, because uh, even though the, the the you know it's like first world problems in some cases in 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 the Nordics, uh, it's still something that relates to how uh, the, um, what do you call it the the prim the basic conditions of working in this structure of where you have a boss that takes the the super profits and decides everything that goes on in the workplace in terms of rights and conditions. Uh, and and then the worker, whether it's in Denmark or in India, they want to have more safety, more better uh, security, maybe uh, better working conditions, and so on. Right? Th those are the same, right? So even though it might be minuscule or lesser uh, um, worries, I guess you could relatively so compared to, let's say, Colombia, where they face much more or harsher forms of rep repression, uh, it's still something that ties into the same premise. That's, so that's the first thing. And the second thing I think that would be interesting and not something that I, I have w researched that much is uh, Nordic social democracy uh, in the, when I mentioned political economy and imperialism, what is the role of Nordic social democracy in this uh, system, right? Because we do rely on, for example, the US uh, a lot in terms of allying ourselves with them militarily and economically. Um, how does that function into or factor into our understandings of other people or other countries, right? We also have tendencies in Nordic social democracies to have, let's say, chauvinist, racist, sexist, homophobic, other types of attitudes. Uh, well, how that originates is, of course, up to debate, but one of the things I was talking about is the, is the material account. And so uh, there's a, it's not necessarily an academic book as such, but there's a, there is a, a book by Torkel Lausen in Denmark called Riding the Wave that talks about Sweden as a Nordic social democracy within the imperialist world system, as he calls it. You know, IKEA and Volvo, what, how they rely on certain profits, sur surplus value being generated in formerly uh, Eastern Germany and also elsewhere, and how that gets transported to create what we have, uh, what Sweden has, uh, healthcare and, and other social democratic benefits. And so, in that sense, it would be interesting to see. How do, what does this mean for, or how apply that type of analysis to Nordic social democratic game industries, if that makes sense, right? Uh, does that matter? Does, it, does our game, work, game workers unite not existing in Finland or in Denmark and so on? Does that, how is that tied into uh, uh, our Nordic social democracies, but also how are these Nordic social democracies or welfare states or whatever you want to call it, also tied into this uh, plundering of uh, cheaper labor markets, uh, you know. So, yeah, I mean, you can basically see that with the Nordic social, with Nordic welfare states that, you know, per per capita we have a lot of emissions, we consume a lot, uh, we have a lot of e-waste. I think Norway is one of the biggest e-waste producers per citizen, for example. You have all these different comparisons that that shows that well, it's not that good <laughs> in terms of globally. And we're still uh, much like the, the U.S., for example, when it comes to consumption and, and so on. Yeah. Anyway, that's a long, long thing. But yeah, I think that would be an interesting, uh, interesting thing to, to research into. I'm not sure how to go about it methodologically. I'm not even sure how to, yeah, like, like where to start or begin or who to talk to. But that would be 
definitely like an interesting thing. Uh, but the, the the challenge is making it too broad and vague versus making it concrete and specific. In let's say the question of game workers unite in Finland, why does that not exist? Uh, like that would be interesting to figure out where to to look or or who to talk to or what to research. Um, Thank you. Uh, is there more questions? Yes. Uh, hi, really interesting. Thank you for sharing. Um, I was thinking about if um, more than the things that works workers already told you about these strategies and the opportunity for helping, for example, other workers like in the global south. Do they know the conditions or the problems of other workers? I mean, the ones that you uh, have worked with the uh, interviews and so, um, they know the conditions of other workers. I mean, for example, if, if these interviews were made in Finland or Europe or these things, do they know the conditions uh, India, China, Mexico, Brazil, whatever. And are, are, are they really like interest in giving these strategies working in collaboration with them? That's a, that's a really good question. And, and uh, I think it kind of reveals like, so the Union Federation executive I talked to who has their hands in different countries like in South America, East Asia and South Asia, in Europe as well, they were aware of what how what that meant, right? But in terms of organizers, uh, less there were less. Uh, I mean, you know, I guess same for me as well. I mean, how much do we actually know about the work conditions in the the global south? Right? We have some. So my article that gets going to get published going to talk about this a little bit. There has been some mainstream discourse on it, and there's a few academic articles on it. And there's some interviews, but you still have the cultural barrier of uh, translating and uh, being there and being the foreign researcher who, because academia is also has a problem with who gets published and uh, so on, right? So usually it's us here in, in, the, in the global north who publish our stuff and talk between each other. Uh, so there's, there's always like a term of access and, and that in terms of knowing how things are actually <coughs> going on in there, right? And I think on a diff on a similar note, so this was the, the work that I actually did for COE Game Call. Is I interviewed and talked, and did a survey with a lot of uh, Finnish and Danish game workers. And in it, I did ask about how do you reflect or position yourself working in Finland or working in Denmark versus, let's say, North America, but also the global south, or, or not the global south, but Eastern Europe, South Asia, East Asia, where there's like poor, uh, worse working conditions, right? And actually, the funny thing, they knew a lot, at least from media or talking to other colleagues about how, how is it in, in North America. But when asked about the Global South, they, they, there was a lot of, um, I don't know what the, la the linguistic word for it, but a lot of, uh, you know, uh, softened language. Like, uh, I'm not sure, I've heard, I think, I'm not sh uh, I haven't heard about, I don't know, uh, but I imagine that. And uh, when it came to the glo uh, to to how it was, how when they reflected themselves, right? So I guess that also shows like a, a lack of knowledge or lack of understanding or lack of communication between those who work in Finland or in Denmark versus, let's say, in other countries um, as well. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I'll, I'll I'll do this real quick. Um, so. It, so actually, I will, I will connect to what he what she asked. So I actually know people who work at Foxconn, um, who, who are making the hardware of, of game controllers, and I visited these factories. So she asked a very good question from the global south perspective: Are these workers aware? Like you don't really know the difference unless you do a comparison, right? Um, you don't really know unless like like you lived in a country. You don't really really know the country that well unless you have experienced it. So for these people in 2003, that's when China actually started to have cell phones for a lot of people. So for them to be able to work at Foxconn and to make um, to make a wage that's better than they would have probably at at a farm or some other conditions. Um, so 
for them is a better outcome for a lot of them, right? Um, but of course, when you offer them a better condition, let's say, um, to be able to have let's say, two TVs or something like that, as a comparison, of course, they would say yes, because that's a better outcome. So, but comparatively, at the condition where they are now, they are having a better life. Um, so before, they probably wouldn't be able to afford a cell phone or um, other things. Like, like just take, take an example. So having a bicycle as a wedding gift that was a luxury. And later, then having a motorcycle, now having a car, having a fridge. So that's a progress people are making in the global south. And then there's the level expectation. For them, that expectation is okay. And they're satisfied. So that's that's like my point connecting to what she asked from the global south perspective uh, in terms of the working condition and also work rights. There is ignorance, a lot of ignorance. But when it comes um, with expectation, they're okay. But when you bring all that together, then they will probably very dis dissatisfied with what people have in the West yeah, compared yeah. to. Well, that's a really good. No, no, that's yeah. A, that's a, yeah, really, really uh, important uh, uh, comment or observation too. I think that's. Um, yeah, I think that's. Um, it it, it kind of goes into the heart of 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 like the what is actually emerging or coming out of places such as China or Malaysia or Singapore and other places where, or India for that matter too, that that's also what some of the union uh, representatives talked about that, like for example, in India, they are increasingly or very skilled at the IT level and the tech level, and therefore actually do uh, really great work. And uh, yeah, just having the same kind of benefits of the resources or uh, wages that you would perhaps get in Denmark or in Finland uh, or elsewhere. and. Um, and I think, but I think the, 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 the key, I don't want to go too far back, and I think the, the key thing that we have to, fo that we want to focus on, right, uh, when we talk about, let's say, work in the global south uh, or in, in China or in Foxconn and, or in Vietnam, where they're doing it now, but they, that's the, the, the relationship, right, that let's say Apple with producing iPhones, they do take that, you know, they take the surplus value that the workers in Foxconn generate, right, and, and I think that's, uh, yeah, that's, that's the thing we, I guess, even though they might get cars or motorcycles and TVs and other things, it's still that relationship is still exploitative and uh, disproportional too. Um, but yeah, no, definitely. I mean, that is also like an important observation to have. Thanks. Thank you so much. So we'll have we'll have we'll have our last question, and then. So I'm interested in. Uh, how game worker is defined and sort of how loosely or tightly you define that kind of impacts on this discussion. Like you could define it around, you know, someone who touched an actual keyboard to make a game to code something, mm -hmm. or you could include the cleaners, the people in a factory that were making a platform. You could include the promoters, the people in the shop that were selling it, the people who designed the internet. Et cetera, et cetera, you know, like, so um, I'm just interested about, like, how that kind of factors in the study. Tom, that's a, that's a great question. And uh, I think that's also a thing I wouldn't be able to, like, answer as such in terms of, I mean, would you do, like, an institutional definition then, like, you, to encapsulate what you say, let's say, clean, cleaning people or managers and other things? Um, and I think actually, as an academic, I would have to rely on other previous research to, to make that definition and not make my, uh, do my own research to come up with that definition. But I think Chris, Chris Young uh, in Canada has made like a, a pretty good uh, dissertation on, uh, he called them game makers, basically, right? It's not, so it's not just, and I think Brendan Keogh also uses the same term uh, to, to talk about that uh, to make games or develop games, you don't necessarily have to be in like a professional, like you said, even touching the keyboard. You don't have to have to be employed or be in a professional, making your own games for profit as such, right? There's, if you want to talk about game work, it's better or game workers, it's better to talk about game makers uh, as such, right? No, oh, yeah, let's see what Tom has to say. Um, like, in, what about games as service, mm -hmm. for example? Like a, a lot of people work in games industry without making anything. It seems very kind of, um, I don't know.
God complex to mm -hmm. say that only makers matter? Well, I mean, well, I don't know, maybe you should talk to Chris or Brendan about that. But, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, no, I, def and I think that's definitely important. And I think also if we, if I were to do like, let's say a study or research into uh, game work, that would definitely be like an important thing. Like people who are, let's say, the secretaries at the game company or yeah, the cleaners and so on, right? And I guess it, it, that kind of relates to what we've also been talking about with academia, right? We talk about academic work conditions or academics and such, but how much does that also encapsulate other people who, who allow uh, these things to exist, right? And I think maybe we could learn from that discussion or research into that as well about like the people who clean up after all the academics have coffee or uh, go to the bathroom or whatever, right? Um, but yeah, no, it's super important. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay, uh, great. Uh, that was our for time for today. Uh, One last uh, applause for Emil. Thank you. Thank you.